We are, man, thank you, Elevate Band. What a wonderful morning of worship. Um, we're beginning a new series today. It's summertime. Have anybody noticed it's summertime, by the way? <laughs> wow. I thought we might have to change the series to something dealing with a location that's hotter than here. I'm not sure. That, anyway, I, I, we didn't change the series title. But we're going we're to do a series called Life-Changing Encounters this summer. So we begin a new series today, Life-Changing Encounters. And so we'll be, we'll be looking in God's Word at different um, stories, different events of life-changing encounters. Now, uh, at some point in the summer, my wife and I will get away for a, a few weeks, hopefully, and have a vacation that's not all planned out yet. And when we do, some of our staff will fill in the pulpit, and they'll also be preaching on life-changing encounters uh, from God's Word. But one of the things I asked them to do was as they preach about some biblical character and life-changing encounters was to tell us some of their personal stories so we can know them better. I think it's really good for us to know our staff and about their own life-changing encounters, what God has done in their life. And so since I've asked them to do that, I'm going to do a little bit of that this morning too before I get to God's Word and we look at a really wonderful biblical character. So let me tell you about two life-changing encounters in my life. And, and I do this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm uh, waiting in a certain direction because I want our students to hear it as much as anything, but it's for everybody. But the first life-changing encounter for me, I'll tell you about, happened when I was 14 years old. Uh, you know a lot of this about me, but I grew up in a church here in Houston, a church not unlike this one, not as large as this one, but the, the worship center was kind of like this. It was, but there was just three sections. The middle section was just like this, but it was pews instead of seats. Then there was a section here and a section here, and then an aisle here and an aisle here. And we were having a revival service in our, in our church, which was really common back then in Baptist churches. And I don't know what night of the week it was, but God was dealing in my heart. When I was young, really young, I had walked down the aisle of our church. I grew up in the church. We were there every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night for RAs. We were there all the time. We, as they say, we got the full meal deal. And it was great. I don't, I'm so thankful for that. But I made an early commitment. I was baptized. But when I was 14, I was beginning to wonder, and God was dealing in my life. Craig, are you, have you given your heart to me? Have you trusted me? And, and during this service, I, I went early that night. I'm not sure how I got there. I wasn't driving yet, but I was the only one in the auditorium. I got there early, and I went in early. God had been dealing in my life, and I sat the equivalent of about probably five or six, seven rows back right in this section right here, just that side of that aisle. And I remember sitting there alone in the church I grew up in, and God was dealing in my heart. And that night, before the service began, as God pulled on my heart. I gave my life to Christ in that worship center by myself. Now, the interesting thing was I knew that night if I did that, as I, as I sit there and struggle that night with that decision, I knew I would get up and make that public that night later when everyone got there. And I knew that was something I would have to do because I'd want people to know about the decision I made, and I did. After the end of the service, I walked forward. I shook my pastor's hand, who was a wonderful, wonderful, godly man, and I explained to him what was going on in my life and that God was doing a work in me, and I'd given my life to him that night. And so I follow the Lord in believer's baptism. That's encounter number one, life-changing encounter number one for me. There was another one three years later. After my junior year in high school, uh, we were going on a mission trip with the kids in that same church. We went on a mission trip. We went up to Montana. And I was at that age in life where I wondered, what am I going to be when I grow up? Josie is still asking me that. What are you going to be when you grow up? I think she might say, if you grow up, I, maybe it's a deal. But anyway, we're on this mission trip. It's after my junior in high school. And I'm at that stage, you know, where am I going to go to college? What am I going to be? What am I going to do? Wondering all those things. And I'd been, I'd, things had been good in sports to that point, particularly baseball. Things had gone well. I knew there was a chance I might have a chance to play. But I knew what I needed was to do what God wanted with my life. And on that mission trip, one night in one of the services on that mission trip, I prayed a really simple prayer. And what I would tell you is, it was to talk about life-changing encounters. And I think this will show itself out as looking at God's word too. Life-changing encounters happen in my life and in your life when all the other stuff of life just gets pushed aside. And you get down to real simplicity between you and God. And the other stuff doesn't matter so much anymore. And that's where God had me at that point that night between my junior and senior year and I prayed a really simple prayer there in Montana, God, whatever you want to do with me, whatever you want for my life, that's what I'll do. Just a surrender of my life. God, I, I want to do what you want me to do, whatever it is. And uh, I shared that with my, with a guy that's my best friend growing up, brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, we were just a few hours apart in age and he was a wonderful, wonderful friend. In fact, he became one of my son's teachers in seminary later. 
And I shared with him, I said, Robert, I want you to know tonight, I just committed to the Lord and just said, God, whatever you want with my life, I'm going to do that. And he kind of jokingly said, ah, you know you're going to be a ball player. Now, I remember I had another year of high school left, and, and uh, we knew it was a possibility, but it, well, that wasn't the idea. The idea was, God, I, I want to do what you want me to do. And about a year later, just about a year later, uh, was when I was drafted in the first round by the Pirates and ended up signing and, and going into baseball. The point is, of both of those stories is, in both cases, God simply reduced me to where it was just God and me and nothing else mattered, and it was just God, I surrender. The most profound, life-changing encounters I've had with God have been the simplest, the simplest prayers, no great long prayer, just God, here I am, and I surrender to you. So just keep that in mind as we begin to look at God's word and we talk about life-changing encounters. I think that will hold true, and I'm almost positive it will hold true for your life. Now, God uses all kinds of circumstances to bring us to those points, But when he gets us to that point, it's a pretty simple deal. It's him and us, and we say yes to him and no to ourselves. So now with that in mind, by the way, I'm thankful for what God did and the doors he's opened and for the grace and mercy and protection he has shown me in my life through these years. And anything that's happened that's of any good is because of him. You know that's true. It's because of him. Now, I want us to turn to a biblical character and look at a life-changing event in his life and see what we can learn from this biblical character character and his life-changing encounter, if you will. Here's the point I want you to think of as we begin this message today. You have the potential to impact people for eternity. Now think about that for a moment. You have the potential to impact people for eternity. Now don't let that just zip right by you because there is nothing you can do with your life that's more important than that to glorify God by impacting the lives of other people. I don't care what title you have. I don't care what you accomplish. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how much success you have from the world's eyes. There is nothing more lasting and impactful that you can do than to impact someone's life for all of eternity, for the glory of God. Now, that's a big deal, but the reality is when we think about it, I think a lot of us think just like this biblical character we're going to look at today, we think, me, how, how can I, how could God ever use me to have this kind of an impact in someone else's life. We're gonna be looking at the life of a guy, and you'll know his name when I say it, but a guy named Gideon. And his story we're gonna look at today is in Judges chapter six. If you want to make your life count, so when you look back on life someday, you want to know it counted, follow these principles we're gonna look at today. I'm gonna give you the principles and then we'll see them in scripture. Here's Here's the first one, and it goes to one of the songs we sang a moment ago, recognize your needs. You want to impact the world around you. You want to impact other people. You want to have a life that glorifies God. Number one, recognize your needs. Now, here's the situation Gideon's in. Chapter 6 of Judges, verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. So remember what's happened in Israel at this time during the period of the Judges? Remember when they had a strong leader, they would serve God? But as soon as they lost a strong leader, they would, they would start worshiping idols and go the other way. And God would raise up some nation, some other nation to oppress Israel, to, to, to make them see and understand that there is a high price of not putting God first. Now, there's a principle here. It's not really the sermon, but I want you to hear it. There's not just for nations, but for you and me, there's a high price for not putting God first in our lives. And if you live any time at all, you'll, you'll learn that truth. There's a high price for not putting God first. And the Midianites were so cruel, they were coming in and destroying all the crops and ruining everything and, and leaving the, taking the animals and everything else and leaving the Israelites nothing. And in verse 6 it says, So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Now they recognize their needs. When God has allowed the Midianites to come in and do all this stuff and take all their food, and crush them, now they recognize their need and they cry out to the Lord for help. Clearly they have a need. And now they cry out to God. Here's the second point. So the first point, recognize your needs. Here's the second point, accept your calling. You want to impact other people? Accept your calling. Verse 7 says, when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. So God did, God's saying, God's reminding them through this prophet. By the way, they're wanting someone to come save them and God sends them a prophet to remind them of how they're messing up. 
And, and he says, you remind them, I did all these things for you, and I warned you, and I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship other gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. So the prophet reminds him, look, the reason you're in this fix is you didn't listen to God, you disobeyed God. And when we disobey God and live our own lives as if he is not there and as if he is not God, there's always a high price to pay. Then verse 11 says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. So, so the angel of the Lord, actually appearance of the Lord, he comes and he's going to talk to Gideon. Listen to the next verse. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Now, I love this. I love this next line. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now, now don't miss the picture. Here's Gideon. He's at the bottom of a wine press, which would have been like really low down in a valley, if you will. And he's threshing wheat. Well, where should wheat be threshed? It should be threshed up on a hillside where the wind's blowing. But he's not, he's down in the, in the bottom in the wine press. Why? Because he's hiding from the Midianites because he's afraid they're gonna come take the food, take the wheat, he's hiding. But yet the angel of the Lord says to him and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Do, do you th- it, it's almost like God has a sense of humor. I, I love how the NASB says it this way. The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And you almost think, yeah, he's almost like he's prodding them a little bit. O valiant water, warrior, look at you, you're down here in the wine press. The Lord is with you. He's hiding. He doesn't look like a hero at all. He doesn't look like a mighty warrior at all. Now, now let me ask you a question. Picture, you picture his scene there and God has come to call him to do something. What's God called you to do? What has God called you to do that you're not doing? What's God calling you to do today that you're not wanting to do? A fair question. But notice here, he doesn't call him mighty warrior because there's something in him that makes him a mighty warrior. He, he calls him mighty warrior because he says, the Lord is with you. That's what makes Gideon a mighty warrior ultimately, is that the Lord's going to be with him. Accept your calling. Here's the third point. Expand your perspective. Expand your perspective. He says in verse 13, This is Gideon. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? You know that feeling, don't you? Why am I going through this? Why am I sick? Why is someone I love sick? Why do I not have this job? Why did this happen? Why did, why did we have this issue in our lives? Whatever it is, why did these things happen? How can you say this is true? The Lord has abandoned us. He's handed us, as, if you will, as in this story, he's handed us over to the Midianites. Our problem is our perspective is so small. We look at our lives and we narrow the focus down and we make it just about us and our little world right where we are. You know, you know, the idea of here I am and here's the world revolving around me and our perspective gets so small and we look at this one little narrow perspective and we don't back up and see the picture of what God is doing, not just in our lives, but in the lives around us and how he might want to use us in his plan and his calling for us. Expand your perspective. Stop the little narrow focus and begin to see things broader. And along with this, the next point, the fourth point is this, abandon your resume. Abandon your resume. In verse 14, God tells Gideon to go with the strength that he had, that God has given him and to to defeat the Midianites. He says, you know, go with God and the strength he's given you and do this. Now listen to what Gideon says in return. But Lord Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh and I'm the least in my entire family. He begins with the excuses. I I don't have the resume, Lord. It's not me. By the way, this is something Moses did when God called Moses, isn't it? Not not me, Lord. I don't speak well. I don't do this. God, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not the kind of leader you need for this. God, this isn't me. You've got the wrong person. It's somebody else you want for this job. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough strength. I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough. And we have all these different excuses. And God says to you and me, as we look at the life of Gideon, abandon your resume. It's not about you. It's not about you and your ability at all. 
And then the fifth point is this, do what God tells you to do. Whatever God tells you to do, do it. Listen to verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. God says, I'm sending you. And then verse 16, the Lord said to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. I'm going to be with you and when you have this battle with the Midianites that you think are so tough, you're going to beat them like it's just one man. That's what it's going to be like when I'm with you. And so the idea here is when, when God says this, we've got to obey. When God says, I am sending you, and God says, I am with you, why would you not say, yes, Lord, let's go? And that's what we see in the life of Gideon. But Gideon wants a sign. Gideon says to the angel of the Lord, who are you really? I've got to know it's really you, Lord. And he says, if it's you, you stay here. I'm going to go prepare an offering for you, a sacrifice for you, and I'll bring it back. So will you wait while I do that? And the angel of the Lord says, yes, I will. And so he goes and prepares a goat and prepares some bread, and he comes back, and, and he puts it on a rock, and the angel of the Lord just touches it with his staff, and fire comes out of the rock and consumes the sacrifice. And, you know, Gideon should get the message about here that he's really dealing with the Lord when this happens. Now, now you get the picture. You see what's happened to this point. This is a great sign. God has come to Gideon. And he's given Gideon his presence. He's shown Gideon his power. He has told Gideon, told Gideon his purpose that he is to go and lead his nation and defeat the Midianites. The Lord is telling Gideon, go, I'm with you. Now, when we walk like this and obey God, God will use us. Now, I want you to look at the five points again. We'll put them on the board for you to look at again. So th there they are. Here's, we learned this in the life of Gideon. You want to impact people for eternity? You want, to, you want to bring glory to God? I could have said it a different way. You want to bring glory to God with your life. You want to make a difference with your life. Recognize your needs. God will make them aware to you. Accept your calling, whatever God calls you to. Expand your perspective. Stop being so narrow because we're not talking about what you can do. We're talking about what God wants to do through you. That's the picture. Abandon your resume. It's not about your training. It's not about your education. It's not about how smart you think you are. It's not about how, what a great leader you are. No, it's about what God wants to do in and through your life. And when you do these things, then simply do what God tells you to do. That's the picture. Now, that's not the end of Gideon's process. Gideon still has a process to go through here, and so will you in your life, and so will I in my life. God gives Gideon his first assignment. God tells him, Gideon, I want you to go and take two bulls and I want you to destroy uh, the, the Baal, the altar of Baal. By the way, it was his father's altar to Baal. They're worshiping false gods. Destroy the altar of Baal and the Asherah. Take two bulls with you. Tear them down. Build an altar to the Lord. Build an altar to me and sacrifice the seven-year-old bull on the altar to me. And Gideon's afraid to do it because he, he can imagine the kind of response he's going to get, but he does it anyway. He does obey God, but he does it at night. He takes 10 men with him, and he destroys the altar of Baal and tears down the Asherah. He builds an altar to the Lord. He sacrifices the bull there. Well, what happens in this first step of obedience? Well, here's, here's, here's what happens, and here's what he learns. The men of the city are ready to kill him. It says, they said to Joash, that's his father, bring out your son so we can kill him. But Joash said, if Baal is, I love this line, if, if Baal is God, let him contend for himself because someone has torn down his altar. Yeah, guys, if, if Baal is really a real God and my son's torn down his altar, you let Baal contend for himself if he's really a God. There's a, there's a lot of purpose here. Number one, God is showing the children of Israel, stop worshiping Baal, that I'm the real God. But, but he's telling and showing Gideon that I'm going to be with you. I told you I would be with you and these men want to kill you. I told you I would protect you and help you in this journey. Do you see that now? So Gideon is beginning to learn to trust in God and how to listen to his voice and how to obey him. And then God gives him another second assignment, a grander assignment. All the Midianites and the Amalekites are camped in the valley of Jezreel, ready to come down on them, bring war against them. And verse 34 says, so the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and they came up to meet them. So just like God promised, he's with Gideon. And so when Gideon calls the people with the trumpet to come, the people respond. And they follow his leadership and they're ready to do battle. Now, 
Gideon questions his assignment. Even now, Gideon is still questioning what God is calling him to do. This is such an interesting story. Now, what I'm about to read you is a really hard passage to teach because, not that it's hard to understand, but it's hard to teach because of how it can be misused. So let me be careful. I want to read it to you, and then we'll talk about it. Here's what he does. He's trying to make sure that he's doing the right thing, that God's really calling him. And he says, Scripture says, he says, if you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, I'm going to put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and the ground is dry, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as soon as you've spoken. So he says, look, God, I, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing here. I'm going to put this fleece on the threshing floor. If in the morning the, the fleece is, has dew on it and it's wet, but the floor is dry, I'll know you're really calling me to do this. And that's just what happens. The next morning the fleece is wet and the floor is dry. But it's still not enough for, still not enough for Gideon. Then Gideon said to God, please don't be mad with me, but one more test. Let the fleece be dry and the dew be on the ground. So now he says, Lord, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to put the fleece out and let the fleece be dry. Let the dew be on the ground. And he does it. And God, again, answers his request. And that's, by the way, that's where we get the expression of putting out a, putting out a fleece before the Lord. That's the idea. But think about this. God has promised Gideon his presence. His, he's got his presence there. He's promised him his power. He's told him his purpose. And now God's showing him his patience. I, I don't know why God tolerated Gideon's persistence and not just believe in his word because God's given him his word. God told him in verse 12, 14, and 16, this is what I want you to go do. And still Gideon is testing God. In public, in public, Gideon's doing the right stuff. I mean, he blows the ram's horn. He calls the people. He's doing the right stuff in public, but the private Gideon is still having doubts. He's still not sure, and he's asking God to give him some kind of tangible proof. That's why I say this is, this is hard to teach because it, it's, it, it's easy for us to put out fleeces looking for... I, I, here's why I think God tolerated Gideon continually questioning like this. And, you, know, I, you know, I always tell you when something is, is my thought, not necessarily scripture, this is what I think. This is what I think. I can't find it in God's word. I think God allowed this in Gideon's life to continue to question and continue to ask because Gideon's heart wasn't looking for a loophole. It wasn't looking for a reason not to believe God. Gideon wanted to be obedient to God. And his, and his fleece, if you will, his questioning was to make sure he was doing what God wanted him to do. He wasn't looking for a reason to have some selfish response from God for him. But he was looking to glorify God and get it right. That's, that's really what I think has happened. But so often when you and I put out a fleece, we say, God, I, we, we maybe pray a prayer and say, God, if you will do this, then I will do this. Or God, I, I'm going to put this out here. And if you answer this a certain way, then I know then I'll go do this for you or whatever it is. I, I'll tell you one personally in my life. I did this when I was a little bitty kid. I, when I told you about the church I grew up in, I remember there was a revival service. And there was this really uh, incredible uh, evangelist that was there and he had this great testimony of how he got called into ministry. I've forgotten what it was. I was a little bitty guy. And, and about, it was something like the wind blew the Bible to a certain page and he read it, you know, go be a preacher or whatever. And I became a preacher or whatever. And, and, and it was one of those things that marks you as a kid. You hear it. And I remember the next day, this true story, I'm not making this up. Next day, I am riding my bicycle in front of my house. And I probably haven't been riding a bike that long. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, I don't really want to be a preacher when I grew up. I want to play some sport or something. I don't, I want to do something fun. And, and I'm riding the bike and I remember looking at my house and saying, God, if, if you want me to be a preacher, you make that brick right there tone gold and I'll be a, I'll be a preacher for you. And, and I, for my whole life, riding up and down that street, I would just look every now and then just to make sure it hadn't turned into a golden brick. And I, God was, and, I mean, that's silly, isn't it? Not, but see, that's the way we do things. That's why I say it's a difficult thing to teach. But I really believe Gideon was wanting to do what God wanted him to do. How do you know? How do you know God's will for your life? How do you read what God wants you to do? Let me tell you five things quickly. This is not the sermon. I'm just going to zip through these quickly. But here's a way you could know God's will. Number one, through his word. Your word's a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path, scripture says. Also through his spirit. John 16, 13 says, he's the spirit of truth. He will guide you in all things. He also guides us through his peace, Colossians 3.15. You have a decision to make. God will give you often peace in your heart, or he'll trouble your heart sometime with a decision. He also guides us through the desires he gives us. Psalm 37.4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. It doesn't mean that you delight yourself in God and you're, all your wishful thinking is going to happen. It means when you delight yourself in the Lord, your things you delight about begin to align with the things that God delights in. And then finally, God guides us through godly counsel. We get godly counsel. But here's the truth about all five of those things. They will never contradict what this book says. Someone gives you counsel or you think you have some word from God and it contradicts this book. It is not a word from God. It will never be outside of this book. So God gives Gideon a final test. The final test God gives Gideon. The Midianites are there. The Amalekites are there. There are 32,000 troops that God has used Gideon to call. 32,000 troops. And God says to Gideon, Gideon, there's a problem. You have too many troops. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure Gideon's thinking, too many? I mean, we could use a few more. And God says, Gideon, now it's too many. Here's why. Judges 7, 2. For Israel would become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. God says, no, no, you're going to be rescued. God, I'm going to use you to rescue Israel from the Midianites, but it's not going to be by your power or by the army's power. Israel can't say it's by my power. He says, here's what I want you to do. You tell all the guys that are afraid to go home. And he did, and 22,000 of the 32,000 went home. And he was left with 10,000, and I'm sure Gideon was thinking, okay, 10,000, that's pretty good. And God says, no, Gideon, you don't get it. That's still too many. We've got to reduce it some more. And so God says, take them down the river, let them get a drink, and separate them by how they drink the water. And if they drink it this way, and if you you lay down in the water and drink it out of it, that's one. If guys pull it up with their hands and kind of lap it like a dog, that's another. Separate them. And when he separated them, there were 300 guys that drank this way and 9,700 that drank this way. And Gideon's probably thinking, okay, 9,700, we're still okay. And God said, no, Gideon, you're missing the point. Send the 9,700 home. And so now Gideon has, he's down to 300 men. Now, I won't, I won't go into the story. I encourage you to go read the wonderful battle victory, but they take their trumpets and they take their clay pots and God tells them exactly what to do and the other army is thrown into confusion and they start fighting each other. And Gideon routes, the, well, not Gideon, but God routes the Midianite army with just 300 men. And so clearly it's God's victory. It's not Israel's victory. It's God's victory. God wants us to trust him fully. God will bring about the events in our lives that cause us to trust him fully. But just like Gideon, we all have to walk through our own personal process, if you will, to learn to do this. I told you in the beginning, I'll tell you about one more life-changing encounter in my life. It came a little later. Um, I had signed, I was playing ball, I played, I made it to the big leagues pretty quick. I was 22, I'm in the big leagues. Played part of the year with Pittsburgh, another part of the next year with Pittsburgh and got traded to Seattle. And so Josie and I moved to Seattle and I'm 24 years old, Josie's 21. And it's my first everyday big league job. I'm the everyday shortstop, I'm 24 years old. Life couldn't be better, right? I mean, God has called me to himself. He's led me into baseball for a purpose. I've told you that story. Life couldn't be better, except it was not good. It was miserable. Halfway through the season, I was absolutely miserable. And the harder I tried, I was playing really bad, and the harder I tried, the worse I got, and the worse I got, the harder I tried. You get the snowball effect. It was, life was miserable. And it all came to a head one night, about the middle of the season, I came home after a really, really bad game. And, and I went home and I tried to pray, I couldn't pray, I tried to read God's word, I couldn't read God's word. It was a horrible night of uh, one of those life-changing encounters. And my logic was before the night was over, God, my life is so miserable, this can't be where you want me. I have to be outside of your will. There's no way this is where you have me for my life to be this miserable. And I decided that I needed to go do something else, that God was calling me to something else. And I decided I would quit the next day, 24 and told Josie, and my intention was to go to the ballpark the next day at the Kingdom in Seattle and tell our general manager that I'm, I'm quitting, I'm going home. To do what, I don't know, I just know God has something else for me. And in my heart, I, I was done, I was finished. And a really interesting thing happened, I can't explain it. I do understand it now, I guess. But when I quit, 
in my heart. And I, this wasn't a trivial thing. It was an agonizing thing. I truly quit, something I worked for my whole life. When I quit, I was so freed up. It felt so good to quit. I mean, I was ready to go home and do whatever it was God had for me. And over the next little while, it became clear to me that God didn't want me to quit, but God wanted me to be willing to quit. He wanted me to be willing to walk away and leave it. I told you earlier, one of the real problems for us, for all of us, is when anything becomes more important to us than God, God's going to deal with that. I, I didn't intend for it to become more important than God in my in my outward thinking, it was never more important than God, but clearly when I wasn't doing well, if it made my life so miserable, it become more important than it should be, right? And I experienced so much freedom, that life-changing encounter. And it was really interesting because once again, like I told you in the first two events, it was the simplest of prayers. When God reduced all the stuff around me, baseball was gone, friendships were gone, all the stuff was gone, and it was just... God, if you don't want me here, I'll quit tomorrow. I'll leave tomorrow. That's simple. Every one of these life-changing encounters for me personally has been the simplest of times when God takes all the stuff away. And it's just, God, I'll do whatever you want. You want me to quit, I'll quit. You want me to stay, I'll stay. You want me to go, I will go. That's what God has for us. The point of the message is really kind of simple, I guess. But I want you to look at the points again of the five things we see from Gideon's life. They're on the screen. Recognize your needs. <laughs> Listen, if you don't recognize your needs, eventually God's going to make your need really clear to you. If you're living outside and you, if something else is more important to your life than he is, he's going to make that need really clear to you at some point, some way, trust me. And when he does, accept your calling. Accept what God's calling you to do, whatever it is. And, and not only accept it, then expand your perspective. Don't just be so narrow. Don't make it just about you and here. God's got a bigger plan for you than that. Abandon your resume. It's not about how smart you are, how educated you are, how much you know, how wise you are, how strong you are, how a great leader you are. It's not about any of those things. And then do what God tells you to do. Because when you get your heart here, God will be with you. And God will go with you in whatever he calls you to do bottom line here's what it is it's not about you it's not about me it's not about you it's not about baseball it's not about preaching it's not about being a doctor it's not about being a lawyer it's not about being in sales it's not about any of those things it's what God wants to do through you wherever he puts you and what God wants in your life and my life is us <laughs> he wants to bring us to the point where it's us and him and we trust him. God, here I am. I trust you to come and give me salvation. I trust you to lay out the purpose and course of my life. When I head the wrong direction, God, I trust you to help me get it right and go wherever you would have me to go. And what I believe you'll find as you walk through life with him, and I think we'll see it in this series too, is that the true life-changing encounters the true life-changing moments for your life will be the simplest. They may be hard. I'm not saying they'll be easy. In fact, they, I found them to be very, very difficult getting there. But once you're there, they're really simple. God, here I am. Do with me what you will.